Hello and good morning everyone. Um, my name is Tony, for those of you who don't know me, and um, as Chase mentioned earlier, uh, it is the fall in the Broward Church, and we're really grateful to be able to um, start uh, this season off with a bunch of really cool things going on. Uh, as, you, as you saw, we have lots of awesome events uh, in the hopper, but the thing I'm really most excited about in terms of the events are our Better Men Barbecue. Um, yeah, amen. If you're a man, yes, make some noise. If you know a man, uh, you can invite them to that. Um, if you have any relationship with men at all, uh, please invite them to this. This is a great time for us to think about what, mean, what it means for us to be men in the 21st century. The fact is, we need more men that are strong. We need men that are brave and that are courageous. Uh, we need men that will stand up against difficult things. We need men to learn to be compassionate, but at the same time, learn to put their foot down and have strength and power in the areas where they need to have strength and power. And so this whole series, I'm sorry, this whole um, Better Men Barbecue is all about two things. One, helping us become great men. Great husbands, great fathers, great friends, great students, great whatever else. And also about barbecue. <laughs> so if you're a man, hopefully you, there's two things. You know, it's smoked meat and learning to be a better man. I can't imagine uh, having anything better. So uh, come out to that when we start those. They'll be in the first week of October. Um, but with all those things going on, the thing I'm actually the most excited about is that we're going to be studying over the next 12 weeks uh, something that I think is, is really important to us and really near and dear to my heart. Um, when you think about the fact that our world is the way it is and, and when you think about all the people who are kind of shifting from, from purposelessness to, to feeling like, you know, a, a, like a sense of meaninglessness, you know, for the next uh, 12 weeks, we're going to talk about the biblical idea of purpose. Today's going to be an introduction to all that, and I have to warn you that today's lesson may feel a little bit like a stream of consciousness, and that's because today I'm hoping to lay a groundwork for the things that we're going to be covering over the next 12 weeks. And so today, I won't have a lot of content. Um, there won't be a lot of passages of scripture that we're going to turn to. Instead, what I'm going to do is just cue up some really good questions. Cue up some things for us to think about. And some of the thoughts we have are existential. You know, they're about like meaning and, and purpose. But overall, the directive for this season is to answer this question. What does the Bible say as a whole? What does the Bible, at, sorry, what does the Bible as a whole have to tell us about why we exist? We're titling this sermon series, The Purpose of God's People, but we could easily title it, Why We Exist. And just so you know, we're about to enter into some deep waters. This is the kind of series that you have to experience, in my opinion, with an open Bible in one hand and a notebook in the other. It's also the type of series that is best processed within a group of people. And so if you go at this alone, you might not get the most out of this. And so I want to encourage you, once again, if you're not a part of a community group, this is the perfect time to join one, especially with the whole redesign thing. If you're also a part of a community group but you haven't really been committed to it, this would be the perfect time to recommit to one. And if you're trying to figure out what that all means and how to sign up for a group, you can do it on BrowardChurch.org. Find a group in your area um, and just decide to jump in and be a part uh, not only of those group discussions but of what we're trying to do here on Sunday morning. So, okay, with that out of the way, let me get into the, the, the point and the question. Do you know why you are here? I don't mean like why you're here today, because uh, I don't know. I don't know why you're here today. But do you know why you exist? And maybe you haven't thought much about it. And maybe the reason you haven't thought much about it is because it's painful often to think about it. Why are you here? What's your purpose? What's your calling? You know, no matter what ethnic or religious background you are a part of or how old you are or, or where you come from on the spectrum of socioeconomics, all of us have asked this kind of core question. Why do I exist? What is my meaning? What is my purpose? Some have even asked the question, is there any meaning at all? Depression is raging in our society. And obviously there's a lot of reasons why that is the case, but I would say that one of the major reasons that it's the case is because we are people, uh, I, I read one study this, this past month that said we are people that are purposeless. We don't really know why we exist. 
And so, of course, because this is such an existential important question, every religion, every religion and form of spirituality, every ism was birthed with some kind of answer to this primal ancient question. In Islam, the purpose of, of creation is to know and to worship Allah. The Buddhists claim that life only has meaning if it's understood as a stepping stone before you get to enlightenment. The Jainism, the answer to that question, why do we exist, is to, quote, realize the free and blissful state of our true being. I have no idea what that means. In America, the purpose of life is to make money, to be happy, to have children and get married, to buy a house with a picket fence, and to have a dog running in the yard. As a Dolphins fan, you exist to be eight and eight. Forevermore, yes, you're always eight and eight. That's all you ever are. I apologize. My point is that everyone attempts to answer these questions. Why am I here? Like, what, what, what am I doing here? And we may ask that question in a more specific way. Why do I work? And what's the, what, should I be in this job? Or should I be in some other job? And really what that boils down to is the question of my own existence, my calling, and my purpose. Even the atheists try to answer this question. For an atheist, there is no meaning or purpose in life. Life is a glorious accident. And so life is only about what you make it. No more and no less. Now in the Christian community, in the church, especially the historical church, there have been attempts to answer this same question. I think the most famous one is probably the Westminster Catechism that says that the chief end of man is to enjoy God, I'm sorry, is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. That sounds pretty good to me. Um, the problem, however, is that the scriptures actually open up with a very different answer to this question. You can look at Genesis chapter one, this is where we're gonna be, really we're gonna look at this passage over and over again throughout this series, but it's where we're gonna to start today, Genesis chapter one, verse 26. As you consider the question why you exist, maybe the best person to answer it is the one who was the creator. Genesis chapter one, verse 26 says this. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image in the image, in, 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 I'm sorry, uh, whoop, let us make mankind in our image in our likeness so that they may rule over the fish in the seas and the birds in the air, over the livestock and over the wild animals and over all the creatures that move around the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves around along the ground. This is page one of the Bible. This is the very, very, very start. And it's where the creator God explains why his creation exists. We read flat out from page one that God made us to be image bearers and to rule. You and I were made to rule. Princes and princesses of the God of the universe. You wonder often why the stories of superheroes and kings and queens are so appealing to us. And I think it's because something deep down inside tells us I was made to rule. Given authority to cultivate, to develop, to fill the earth, to subdue it, to increase in number, and to carry the creator God's image to the rest of the whole world. We are on a mission from God to partner with him to bring the world somewhere great. And that's pretty awesome, wouldn't you agree? And so that's your answer. Series is over. <laughs> Except not really, because what in the world does any of that mean? Like, how do you actually make that work? Like, what does it mean to rule? What does it mean that we are to subdue the whole earth, that we are to fill it? What does it mean to rule over the fish of the sea? What does it mean to bear the image of God? How do we put that into context, into this fallen world where we have seen some rule and rule terribly? What does it mean for the brokenness of this world and the, the, the sense that we are like vile and evil people in many ways? What's involved in the statement, we carry the image of God? See, to me, this is the answer, but in fact, it poses more questions than we began with. So that's why we need 12 weeks. 
I could give you a pithy thought and leave you to try to figure it out by, your, by yourself, but instead, I just wanna go deep from the scriptures. And I wanna help us to reform our imagination on why in the world we're actually here. I wanna talk about what it means to be a human. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna look at all the great sections in scripture. We're gonna look at the canon. We're gonna look at all the great episodes of the Bible. We're gonna look at the doctrines of of the biblical faith. And we're gonna see how they all come together around the Bible's central character, God Almighty, and also the central plan, this plan, given by God to his people. We're gonna see how it all is traced from page one to the very last chapter that this mission, the calling of man, the purpose of his people, unites the Bible from creation to the new creation at the very end of scripture. That's where we're headed, but first we have to lay some groundwork. So you have to stay with me. I promise at the end I'll give you something relevant, but for now I just want you to hang in there with me for the next couple of minutes because we're gonna have to define some terms and get ready. And so if this is your first time here, This is a great time to start coming out because over the next 12 weeks, you'll learn what we're about and also hopefully you'll learn what you're about. Amen, you with me? Okay, let's talk for a moment about theology. You've heard this word before. For those unfamiliar with theology and the more specific term, biblical theology, let me just explain what it means. Biblical theology is when you take an idea, a doctrine or a thought, and you trace it all the way through scripture. You take it from Genesis to Revelation, author after author, you read the whole concept in the literary library, you go thought by thought, and you start to get a big picture on what God is after. So when we say theology, what we're saying is understanding what the scriptures are after. Biblical theology is supposed to prevent the constant temptation to take the biblical text out of context. All of us have a tendency of preferring the scripture of the day rather than the depth of the Bible. Like I love the scripture of the day, it's like wow, this is great, but but we love the Instagram post, like that seems more appealing to us, but really what, it's hard to understand the point of the Bible if you just look at singular verses. You get my thought? For example, you could kind of have a warped understanding of God's forgiveness if you just read the story of Ananias and Sapphira. If you're familiar with that story, the story basically says Ananias and Sapphira held back some of their offering to God and God killed them on the spot. And you could get up here and go, God will kill you if you don't give your offering, right? Which would be a very intense message and also totally out of context. And you will understand the, the idea of giving or the idea of forgiveness because you just took a single part of the scripture and you removed it from its context. Theology, We use theology to prevent that from happening. It helps us sort ideas. So this series is gonna be a biblical theology of our purpose, or another word for that is our mission. And here's the potential problem that comes along. Theology and mission don't feel like they're together. They feel like they're two diametrically opposed thoughts. Mission has to do with doing, dynamics, achieving results, and theology has to do with thinking, contemplation, and prayer. She believes it, come on. And so there's a tension, right? There's an understanding that like theology and mission are kind of, they feel like they're at odds with each other. But hopefully what we'll find out is that there should be no mission of the church without deep roots in a theological biblical soil. So like if you think about doing, 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 doing without thinking about why you do it, eventually you'll find yourself very far from the original intention of what you're doing. And if you just think without doing anything, then you'll find yourself as a monk. And so, are monks bad? No, but we're not really made necessarily all to be monks. Do you get the point? Okay, so with all that out of the way, we're gonna go back to Genesis 1. I'm gonna do a little bit of foundational ideas about what the scriptures is teaching there, um, and then we'll come back and have some more discussion on this idea of mission and theology. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 1 and just kind of understand what we're looking at here. In Genesis chapter one, verse 26, the words are this, then God said, who is God? God, the scripture, at this point in the scriptures, we don't really know who God is. We don't understand the way he was revealed himself to Abraham, we don't understand the way he revealed himself to us in the person of Jesus. All we understand in Genesis chapter one is that God equals creator. 
As the song says, from no point of reference, he spoke to the dust and fleshed out the wonders of life. We don't know him, we don't understand him. All we know is that from nothing he made everything. And it's beyond what our feeble minds could ever really truly comprehend. He is creator of the cosmos. And so the, the readers, the first century, the early century readers, the people who would have read this first would have looked up into the sky and gone, who is this God? We're given a title. The word God here is actually the word Elohim, which is just the title for a divine being. This is who we know. This is who we understand so far. He's a creator, a divine creator. And what does he say? Let us make mankind into our image and in our likeness. So this creator is saying, let us, who is us? There have been you know, thousands of years of debate on who us is, but let me just give you the two most dominant ideas. One is that he could be talking about what we call the divine council, all the angels, all the eternal beings. He could be saying, hey, let us make men eternal. That could be the idea here. Or, and probably more likely, he could be talking, this is the first reference to the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We know that Jesus, the Bible says in Colossians chapter one, was the one who all things were created through. So anyway, he says, let us make mankind. This is the Hebrew word Adam, which um, is, trans is where Adam's name comes from, but it also could be translated as mankind. The, the author's trying to help us understand that actually what, what God is saying here is God is making all of the human race. That, that's what he's saying. He make mankind into our image. This word is the word like icon or it could be the word statue. He makes us statues of him to be put into the temple of his creation. We are icons, images of this creator God. And then he gives this creation a really specific instruction. It says, they're created so that they may rule. That's the word radash, it could mean to, to dominate, it could mean to, to, be, to hold supremacy over, it means to rule, rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Notice that Adam, mankind, before they're given anything else, the first thing man is ever given, and you, you may wanna write this down or note this somewhere because we're gonna go back to it over and over again, is that they're given responsibility. We aren't given blessings, we aren't even given rights. The first thing we're given is a responsibility. Responsibility to be sovereign over the creation. It's interesting because if you consider all of the other early um, religions, especially during the time when Genesis was written, none of the gods ever created man to do, to rule. They always created man to serve the gods. Man's role was to be subservient to the gods that created them. But when God makes man, he says, you are gonna be with me, partner with me, rule with me. It's a pretty awesome idea. We are not just created things made to be pushed to, the, to obscurity. We instead are image bearers. We are gonna hold the image of the God who created us, unlike any other thing that was created. The difference between you and a tree is that a tree was not created in the image of God. It's pretty amazing. So that they, so God created mankind in his own image. We heard this already. In the image of God, he created them male and female. What's the point here? He's trying to say it's all of the human race. He created them. This is just a reiteration of the things we mentioned earlier. And something that's repeated in the Bible, however, is something that we're supposed to take very seriously. If you see a text repeated over and over again, what it means is take this seriously. Listen to this. Pay careful attention. And so it's no surprise that that responsibility is repeated again in verse 28. So God, so God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. We'll talk about this a, a little bit later. Fill the earth and subdue it. 
Again, the idea of ruling or dominating it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the air, over every creature that moves along the ground. Man's responsibility was to learn God's creation and then to help him rule it. He blessed them. How were they blessed? They were given dominion. They were given a divine image. They were given the ability to have relationships with him, but also with one another. They were given personhood. They were given this ability to understand God's creation and a capacity to know him. They were blessed with reproductive um, responsibility. And each of them were told to fill the earth with the image of God. And so all of this is so important. And so because it's so important, we're gonna hit this verse almost every single week in one way or another. But for now, here's what you need to know. Genesis 1, 26 to 28, lay the groundwork for discovering our purpose. You want to know why you're here, you have to really understand Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28. And that's why we're gonna keep on studying it. This is our mission. Genesis 1, I said the word mission and then I said the word purpose and I'm using those terms interchangeably on purpose. But I just wanna make a little point here. If you grew up in this church or pretty much every other church, you have heard several iterations of this idea that you should not make your purpose into your mission. If you ever heard that, it, the, the point is don't make evangelism the point of Christianity. And I totally agree with that statement. But, but what that statement assumes is that the mission is evangelism. And what we will discover is that that's not even close to all it is. Let me just give you a little bit of a hint, like just a snapshot of what we're gonna talk about in future weeks. The word mission comes from this Latin word which looks a lot like mission, which I don't know how to pronounce, which originally comes from this Greek word, which looks like the word for apostle. It means ascending. Mission means what you are sent to do. The apostles were sent, but they're actually not the first people to have ever been sent. There was some sending, Abraham was sent, and Moses was sent, and Jonah was sent. In fact, if you look at the wide gamut of all the people that were sent in the Bible, what you find is that people were sent to do all sorts of things. Here is just a short sampling. Joseph was sent to be in a position to save lives in a famine. Genesis chapter 45. Moses was sent to deliver the people from oppression and exploitation from Egypt. That's Exodus chapter three. Elijah was sent to influence the course of international politics. 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 15 through 18. Jeremiah was sent to proclaim the God's word, Jeremiah chapter one. Jesus claimed the words of Isaiah, that he was sent to preach good news, to, um, to proclaim good news, freedom from the captives, sight to the blind, and offer release for the oppressed. Luke chapter four, verse 16. The disciples were sent to preach and also to heal Matthew chapter 10, the apostles were sent to baptize, and make disciples of all nations, Matthew chapter 28. Jesus, was sent, Jesus sent the disciples, the Bible says in, in John chapter 20, the same way that he was sent, which begs some questions, how was Jesus sent? Paul and Barnabas were sent with famine relief, Acts chapter 13. Titus was sent as a trustworthy um, financial administrator, shout out to Mary Hathaway. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 16 through 24. Apollos was sent as a skilled Bible teacher. And so what, what, what are we saying? There is a wide range on people's mission or their sending. God sends people to do all sorts of things, including famine relief, administration of justice, preaching, teaching, evangelism, healing, ad administration in general. And so even a casual reading of scripture will show you that mission cannot just be evangelism. And so the question begs, then what else is it? And we'll talk about that in future weeks. So, so let, me just, let me just say this. I'm going to use mission and purpose interchangeably. I'm also gonna use calling, mission, and purpose interchangeably also because I just don't wanna play the game of like, what's the difference between purpose and mission? I just, I just don't wanna do that. And my point is to illustrate that it's actually a larger scope than we may have ever imagined. 
what God is calling you to do is actually significantly more detailed than you could ever possibly imagine. In fact, God's mission then, God's mission for his people is for the sake of the whole of his creation. God is trying to impact everything. Just like he created everything, he wants to impact everything by his image bearers. This leads to all sorts of questions. Here's a sampling. Do we have missional responsibility for the creation? How about nature? Should you be an environmentalist? You may rightly feel uncomfortable with that question because of politics. <laughs> and we're not sure, okay, what's real and what's just a media frenzy? But the question still stands. Is the environment a matter that, that should be on the agenda of the Christian mission? How about like our biblical theology? How does it help us address that question? Are we accountable to the creatures? Here's another thought. What does this have to say about the impact that we're supposed to have in the area of justice? H how about the prisoner in Broward County's jails? What's our relationship to that person supposed to be like? Or the, the, the el elderly people who have no family who are, who are put into homes? What's our relationship with them? How about the guy who lives in Bangladesh and works for $5 a day making t-shirts? What's the mission's relationship to them? Of course, we're gonna talk about this in future weeks. Here's the main idea and here's what we know so far. When man was created, they were given responsibility. We were created to rule, to lead. What this looks like, we have to really unpack because it can head in two separate directions. We were created to bear God's image. I just wanna reiterate again, you are a divine being. You were given something. You are very different than the iguanas on Orange Drive. There's something different about you. You know it, but what is it? We'll talk about this in future weeks also. And you were created to fill and subdue the whole world, which includes much more than you may ever imagine. And remember, this is just an introductory introductory idea, and I'm here to kind of prime the pump and get you excited because I'm excited about this teaching. Um, but, but here's something else that we're gonna address in this series that I think is really important. We have been given this incredible amount of responsibility, and we've been given this mission, and we've been given this task, and so a question may arise in my mind, well then, does our purpose, does, I'm sorry, does God's purpose for us depend on the type of people we are? So yeah, so we need to kind of, uh, we need to be thinking about creation and we need to be thinking about ruling and filling the earth, but is that mission primary or is the personhood of the one doing the mission primary? I once heard it asked, what type of person is a mailman? The answer to the question is, it doesn't matter as long as they deliver your mail. Now I don't agree with that, but you get the point. Have you ever thought, I wonder what the morals of my UPS driver is? No, you just expect them to do their job. Is that the way that God thinks about us? I don't care who they are as long as they get the job done. Does God care about our morals? Does God care about our integrity? Does God care about how we respond to things or is the most important thing to get the job done. And before any of you start doing crazy things, we're gonna talk about this in future weeks, but I just wanna give you an answer really quickly because it would be on my conscience if someone did something ridiculous tonight. The answer is that, sorry, go back, this is a cool slide, is that God is passionately concerned with the kind of people that, the, that we are. And our purpose can be critically eroded by our character. And so, if you really want to have a great purpose in life, you really need to be thinking about your character. As much a part of the missionary identity, uh, uh, the, uh, rather, the mission is as much a part of the job as the missionary identity. This, of course, will lead to really some, some great discussions in future sermons. So, let me kind of wrap it all up. 
and just this is just an intro and I understand that some of this feels a little bit deconstructionism like I'm trying to destroy things and, and I'm not that's not my intention my intention instead is to get you kind of excited about the study that we're going to have because I hope that at the end of this you will have an uncompromising loyalty to the God of the Bible that is unlike anything you have now and my hope is that after you read these scriptures, you're gonna be floored and blown away at the specific detail that God has to say about the things that he wants for us to do. And I want you to walk away with the sense of reverence for the God of the Bible revealed as Yahweh in the Old Testament and as revealed as Jesus Christ of Nazareth in the New. And as you come prepared for the next few weeks on our journey, these are just a sampling of questions that we're gonna have. My hope is that, these, that you will kind of be exposed to, to the richness of scripture, and in your study you will find answers to these broad questions, but you'll also, some of the questions will just fade away into obscurity, because you'll see that the God of the Bible is just so much more beautiful than you ever imagined. And with all that said, let me actually close you with a relevant idea. Genesis chapter one, page one of the Bible, before we are given anything, I said this before, we are given responsibility. Think about it. God makes the world. And then he says, you take it. That's pretty amazing. If you ever had a nice anything, you've never wanted to give it to anyone. Because nice things get destroyed by people who didn't make them. And you start thinking, well, I wonder if nice things, the world, has been destroyed by people who didn't make it, us. Again, a discussion for future. But, but man, here's what I feel passionately about. Before I was given any rights, before I was given any blessings, the first thing I was given was responsibility. And if you want to know why you exist, you have to figure out what you're responsible for. I'm gonna make that slide come up. If you wanna know why you exist, you have to figure out what you're responsible for. If you wanna know why you exist, you have to go in your mind and consider, am I responsible as a mom and dad? Am I responsible for my children? As a spouse, am I responsible for my, for my husband or wife? As a child, am I responsible for the, for the community that I've put in? As a member of this congregation, am I responsible for this church family? As a citizen, am I responsible to this country? You start thinking, whoa, well, as a citizen of heaven, am I responsible for God's kingdom as, as, as a, broader, a broader sense? You start thinking about the responsibilities that you've been given, and you start to piece together why you actually exist. And though this journey, and through this journey, we'll figure out talents and abilities and skill sets and all that fun stuff, and we're gonna kind of lay a, 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 a foundation that hopefully you can build on, but really, if you want to know why you exist, you have to figure out what you're responsible for. And here's an important idea. When you were created, listen to this, you were created with a purpose. You are not a cosmic accident. You were given the keys of the world. You are divine and you are important. You were given responsibility and so here's my warning to you, don't take it lightly. Your life has meaning. Don't let anyone reduce you down to something that, you know, this big whatever thing that happens and all of a sudden, you know, you became man. Don't do that because if you do it, you will first off, lose your responsibility and then eventually you will lose all meaning in life. You will become a nihilist. You will become someone that doesn't understand the purpose of their own existence. You were made for something. You were made with a bigger story in mind. You were made to rule the world and I believe that idea is what makes the suffering worth it because I can carry my difficult times if I understand that I was made for something. I can go on when hard times happen if I realize that I have responsibility. I have to carry my own load. Galatians chapter six tells us that. I have something I was put on the earth to do and so do you. And one day you'll die and someone else will take that. But for now, you have responsibility. Don't trade responsibility for impulsive, low-class pleasure. Pleasure is not the purpose of life. Happiness is not the purpose of life. You were not made to surf Instagram. 
You were not made to watch Netflix. You were not made to go on vacation. You were not made to have sex. You were not made for pleasure. You were, uh, you were made to enjoy pleasure. That's a whole other conversation. But you were not made for those things. And if you exchange responsibility for pleasure, eventually you will find no real meaning in life. I'm just letting you know. So we were made for something. We were made to be somebody. Don't take that, li- don't take that lightly. Carry your own ra- weight. You are a ruler. Step up, be the man or woman you are supposed to be. You are the child of a king. You are a prince or a princess. And if you want to figure out exactly how you play into the wide scheme of life, come back next week and every other week after, and we'll get to it then. I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray because, um, I'm going to pray and then, um, yeah, for communion, and then, and then we'll be dismissed in here in just a moment. Father, we are um, incredibly grateful uh, that we are people with a purpose. Lord, I think, about, I think about these passages of Scripture and these things that we will study, and I'm just, I just cannot wait for us to be reinvigorated by the idea of calling and mission and purpose again. God, thank you for entrusting us with it. God, I know that we have not always done a great job, but I pray that we can be people that repent in those areas and step up and become the men and women you want us to be. God, I also want to take a moment to think about our time of communion. As every week we take that small piece of bread and that that little bit of juice that represents Jesus' sacrifice, I pray that today our reflection will go to his purpose. Lord, he came because he knew we needed to be reconciled with you. And that's the reason why he could joyfully go to the cross. His suffering, even in his suffering, he was able to have joy because he understood the reason why he was sent. God, let us have that same heart. Father, I pray today that as we reflect on who we are and who we ought to be, Lord, that you will give us just a renewed passion for discovery, a renewed passion for theology so that we can actually do the work it takes to discover who we are supposed to be. Dad, I love you. I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for his sacrifice. I thank you for the fact that we can remember him. Please let us not take that lightly. We love you in Christ's name. Amen.